Hi, folks. Rich Folly, back at, back at AWP 2019. I'm Rich Folly. We're here at AWP. There's an amazing group of people here, writers, writing professionals from all over the country. And I'm sitting right now with Amber Tamblin, who's the author of an important new book called Era of Ignition, Coming of Age in a Time of Rage and Revolution. So nice to have you. So happy to be here again, Rich. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I'm We're just sneaking some water a water right in. Now. Yes, That's right. thank you. <laughs> because you've been fighting a cold and other things. Yeah, right I now. feel like everybody has just, it's also just like blowing out your vocal cords from talking so much. This really, this really is like a a high school reunion for all um, for all authors from across the country. It is. So every time you're seeing someone, you're like, oh my God! I know. How do you walk vocal. across the floor without even getting to our, our I our honestly space. put my head down to come <laughs> over here. I yeah. ran into three people and I was like, gotta go, I gotta go yeah. to an interview. But that's, that's kind of the fun of it, that's the joy. Yeah, before we talk about your book, you are doing a lot here. You have an event yeah. tonight with Lydia Yuknavich, who is with us, yes. or this afternoon at Powell's yeah, here in Portland. Yep. An amazing space, amazing yeah. bookstore. Yeah. Lydia is wonderful, was with us yesterday. How cool to be paired with her. Yes, I love her so much. She and I have done so many different things together. Roxanne Gay and I run a, um, a, a literary series that we do where we showcase um, writers from different genres, like the best of femi feminist literature. Lydia's read for us a bunch of times and she and I have just become really close over the years. I just love her. That's cool. Yeah. Your whole world now is this world, right? <laughs> I mean, you, the title is really relevant because Era of Ignition, it feels like that's what's happened to your literary career, your writing yeah. career, and your directing career. But we'll talk about that too in a little bit. But I started <laughs> to talk to you the first time for Dark Sparkler, that's but right. you've written other stuff since and before. And this book really sort of encapsulates that whole sort of change in your life, the decision to really push down this path reclaim this other other side of your creative life and, right. and to own it yourself and not have anyone else that sort of describe to you how it has to happen for you. Tell me about that that sort of understanding, that moment when you decided to move in this direction. Yeah, I mean, I, for me, I was trying to encapsulate and find a term, a, a piece of a language that we could all sort of take into our day-to-day -day life that would describe this this palpable rage and and, and severely condensed shift that we've all felt in our in our lives, especially in the last two years, I think, in the face of our current presidency, but also um, in the face of 2017's Me Too movement, which is sort of what I've just called it because it, it did not start in 2017. It started with Tirana Burke many, many years ago, over two decades ago. Um, but just what it's been like for everybody, what we've all been sort of feeling like in the, in the the, the, what feels like the wild, wild west, sort of, at, at a certain level. Um, and, and what does it look like after we've had this both personal existential crisis and what feels like a national existential crisis where we're questioning our values, we're looking at who we are, we're looking at the negative and the positive of what we've been as a nation, and what comes after that? So what comes after the rage? What comes after the sort of, the, the extreme quick pause and, and this, sense of everyone going to their corners and trying to, to um, reacclimate to the current climate and the current ways in which we are living. Uh, and that's where this idea of an ignited era came to me, of, of, this, of a condensed time of, of real palpable change, which is what we're living in right now. And I feel like my own personal trajectory has just gone sort of alongside that. I happen to be going through my own revolution as the nation's going through its own. Yeah, the, uh, the, this whole thing is layered on top of the Me Too thing. Yeah. You were one of the many founding organizers of Time's Up, an yeah. organization that's been really vocal. And you wrote an essay or, or an op-ed in the New York Times in 2017 that really got us so much attention. I mean, you really stepped out into that world yeah. aggressively when, with, with uh, I'm, I'm done with not being believed, mm -hmm. which was, at the time, it's one of those things that sort of spread like wildfire. It was yeah. right on top of everything that was happening with yeah. Me Too. And it talked about your your experiences with James Woods and, and as an actress in general. Yeah. That was such an intense moment for you. Were you always ready to just kind of take that big leap and be a vocal leader in this movement? Well, I, I, I think that I've always been very outspoken. Um, it has always gotten me in trouble at certain points within the, the confines of the entertainment business. Um, I once you know, got in trouble when I was doing Joan of Arcadia for saying something about Les Moonves and everybody, all my representatives were like, eh, be careful how you say things. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's always been okay kind now, of. now, of yeah, course, yeah. I know, the <laughs> irony now. But, um, but I think it's always been in my nature to try to, to speak up, again, pertaining to my own industry, to the entertainment business when I see there's a problem. But I don't, I think that really the 2016 election, 
I was a big supporter of Hillary Clinton's. I co-ran her youth outreach program in 2000, uh, the 2008 election. I was a surrogate again for her in the 2016 election. And I think that, that something pivotal changed for me, I think it did for many women during that election, not so much that we were upset and, and done with not being believed in the face of, of Donald Trump, but done with not being believed in the face of a very capable woman candidate losing to somebody who was not qualified, which is an experience no matter how you feel about Hillary Clinton as a, as a politician or, or her, um, her platform. Uh, you know, you, we can all agree that systemic misogyny and sexism played a huge part and a huge factor in that election. So for me, that was sort of like the pin getting pulled on the grenade. I was sort of like the metaphor, the only metaphor I can think of is that it had been, it had been there for a long time within me, the sense of feeling like I need to detonate something. And, and that election really changed it. That coupled with the Harvey Weinstein story and this sort of exposure of all of a sudden all the women across industries getting in rooms together and talking and saying, well, this happened to you, this happened to me too. And all of us realizing that we've just been, we have been silenced for so long and not being able to talk about those things publicly that, that it was like a, a literal eruption in which we didn't ask for permission to speak about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And that, that op-ed was a direct result of that, of that upheaval and that change. So it wasn't like I tepidly went out and thought, I'm going to write about this and who knows how it's going to land, I'm worried. It was, it was from a place of anger, it was from a place of frustration, it was from a place of having parts of my of my own creativity and my own self not felt seen for my entire 20 year acting career, feeling like there was so much more that I wanted to do and that this was just another example of being boxed out and pushed out of my own trajectory. So that, that op-ed was something that came out um, fluidly and fast and was not something that I thought about uh, or, or gave much consideration as to what the implications of it would be. And I'm glad that that happened in mm. that way because you know, I think for women, activism is not a choice. It's a, it's it's our act of survival. You know, that's the way in which we survive in this world is we speak up and often put our, our livelihoods in danger sometimes by doing that. Yeah, like how has this community that we're surrounded by right now, the writing community, the poetry community, um, the literary community, provided sort of that fuel that you've needed as, as say, compared to the acting community and the other artist communities that you've been a part of? Well, it's interesting. You know, I can't, I first, before I wrote fiction and this, and nonfiction, I came out of poetry, as you know. You know, we, we spoke before about Dark Sparkler, and I wrote um, two books before that of poetry. And poetry is always, I think, where my heart has, has lived uh, in, a, in a deeply um, spiritual and emotional sense. So everything that is, has come from my creative life, whether that's acting, whether that's directing, has been, um, has been the, the planted seed, has, has the source of it has come from poetry. So they are, they are informed and inspired by poetry, but not the other way around. And I think it took me many years to figure out how to vocalize that. I, people would always ask me in interviews and say, how does poetry and acting inform each other? You know, how does your writing and acting inform each other? And the truth is that they, they don't really. I think poetry is what moves everything for me. It's, what, it's the way in which I see the world, the way in which I write op-eds, it's the way in which I you know, direct scenes, it's, it's what I've always been. So this, I, you know, this is my ninth year coming to AWP. I didn't go last year, but nine years I have been here over a course of time. And I just love it because you get to see all the writers and the editors and the people that you have met along the way and people who have supported your writing career, people who might support your writing career in the future. But um, that's one of the things I love about being here is it feels grounded in the foundation of, of who I am and where I first started. Yeah, it's powerful, you're right. And I think that there's a pulse here on everything that's going on that's very, very fresh and new and now. The other element uh, though is that there's a, a, a cacophony of different perspectives and points of view. And I think one of the things you mentioned earlier is really interesting to me now, especially as we head into another election cycle that's starting yeah. to kick into gear, is the way the sort of, I don't want to call it revisionist, but the, the definition of the Hillary Clinton campaign, something I know you supported. And she's always been a lightning rod, we know that. And yet, she's now become sort of a definition of, of white feminism or something that maybe is done or that they're sort of pushing it's time to move on. You hear that all the time. 
And then there's this new version that is is more intersectional, that that's, you know, includes black feminism and all sorts of other variations. What do you think about the way that that sort of campaign is being treated in retrospect, and also how together this whole groups can come together? Because it's exploded oh out. God, all Rich, these voices. You have two and a half hours. Well, the voices have all come out. We've, you're right. The doors have been blown off. Like yeah. right, everybody's talking now, and all that's done is created a lot of flowering areas of different perspectives. Will they come together? But I guess? I'm see. I'm. I don't even know where to begin in this conversation, other than to say I think it's okay for people to call. Hillary Clinton a white feminist because she is. I mean, I have owned so much of my own uh, life and, and feminist ideals growing up as that of a white feminist as well, and we can't really work to change the problems of feminism and the problems of white feminism unless we own not just the best part of ourselves, but the weakest part of ourselves, the worst part of ourselves. And it's hands down, there are major blind spots in the way Hillary ran her campaign, uh, the way that she sometimes spoke to people or some of her policies were presented. And I think it's okay for people, like I said, to go to their corners and say, I don't vibe with you right now. I don't really want to you know, reach across the aisle and come to terms with you. It's not where I'm at at this moment. Right now, I am about finding out what is important for me, what I want for my community, trying to figure out how I can make things better, and when I know this, I'm going to then come out to you. And, and that, that is really what it feels like in so many different ways, and especially in factions of feminism, where people, where women are trying to figure out not just how we can support each other, but to really now examine in the face of the male perspective, the patriarchal opinion being out of the picture for a second, how have we related to each other? How have we not related to each other? How have we taken care of each other? How have we not taken care of each other? How have white women missed the mark and not really looked at any other women outside of just white women as part of the feminist cause? These are very important things, and I think no matter what what happens with the with the 2000 with the 2020 election and the women that are running, you know we have Kamala Harris, we have some incredible candidates, incredible women. We actually have choices now, which we've never had before. We will still see one thing through and through. We even see it with Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, who's a phenomenal politician, phenomenal thinker, speaker. I think she's the future of the Democratic Party but she is not immune to pervasive sexism and misogyny. When you see people come out and say, she shouldn't, you know, she shouldn't be wearing that on her first day um, as a congresswoman because she's from the Bronx and you know, that it makes her look like she's too rich or whatever the language was used, it was sort of disparaging and talking down about her. Um, we will see that with all of the women, whether it's Elizabeth Warren, whether it's Amy Klobuchar, no matter who, who we are gonna see run, we are always going to see some form of that, and that is the thing that we have to keep picking away at and keep confronting. No matter the no matter the the identity of that person and how they um, how they how they live in this world. So the thing we can learn, at least from Hillary Clinton and the experience of her as a president, was that until mediocre women can become the president of the United States in the way that so many mediocre men have been the president of the United States, until mediocre writers can get six-figure figure deals with major publishing houses in the way that men get six-figure deals, you go on and on across industries. We are not equal, because we will always be putting women on a platform, on a, on a pedestal that is unattainable to achievement. But there's no way for us to actually get there and say that this is equal and that we are equal to men, which is all that we're asking for. At the end of the day, any f feminist conversation is about that. You know, in, in Ruth Bader Ginsburg's famous words when she says, you know, we are not asking, I'm paraphrasing, but special, we're not asking for special treatment. We are just asking that our brethren take their foot off our necks. And that's really, I think, that all of it's about. So, so when, we, when we study and we look back at somebody like Hillary Clinton and her campaign, to see those flaws, but to remember at the core that it is important that we honor all different kinds of women and including honoring our flaws and our inability to be perf perfect, especially in large positions of power. That to me is the future of what women in high authority positions of power will look like. Amber, you got your hands around that question pretty well for saying that you didn't know how I to do that. I have a lot, I could go good. on, like I have a lot of feelings well, about it. Well, there's a good segue there because you talked about the, how it goes on and on across the industries. And I yeah. think one of the examples that you write about in your book was uh, Paint It Black, the, the, the movie that you produced, directed, uh, Janet Fitch's great novel, yeah. you brought it to the screen, and that you uh, felt it was simply because 
you were a woman that they didn't feel that this was the right movie at the time or that they put you in a couple of boxes that didn't really fit for what they wanted at the festivals, et cetera. Yeah. And you felt like that really, I mean, it ended up being distributed and everything went out into the world, but you felt like at that, at that time, it was simply because you were the wrong sex. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. If you've seen even in the last couple of years, there's, or actually, sorry, the last few months, um, uh, some of the women who work with Time's Up, Tessa Thompson and Brie Larson and an amazing um, director named Angela uh, Robinson, came up with this thing called the 4% Challenge, which was really asking uh, executives and asking um, production companies and, and you know, uh, huge companies like Warner Brothers and, and distribution companies to try and work with just one female filmmaker a year and to, to try to bring the number up to just 4% of annual directors in large, big budget films being women. It's below right now 4%. So that should tell you a lot. And, and the fr a fraction of that is women of color. Um, so I think looking at it, you know, I wish, I wish there had been this sort of support model in place when my movie came out a couple years ago. Um, it was a much more uphill battle and people were not ha willing to have conversations, not only about, you know, hiring women directors and, um, and making sure that their movies are, are seen uh, and, and bought and sold, um, but really valuing the female perspective, which I think is the next big hurdle that we have to get over. So now while we have all these conversations about inclusion, you know, there's been a, the, the Academy of uh, Television Arts and Sciences, which votes for the Academy Awards every year. They brought in a record number of, um, of women and people of color as voting members this year, that last year, which was, uh, Let's see which if was that huge. Works. Hopeful. It was huge, but you have to change the perspective. You have to change my father's generation. You know, my father, Russ Tamblin, he was in West Side Story, and you know, he's been in the Academy for 40 years, and my, my dad is not the person whose perspective needs to be changed, but his generation is. How do you get them to value the female perspective and the story? Because that is the next hurdle that we have to get over in saying it's not just enough to tokenize us and say, well, we're going to include women because, and women's films and stories about women because we have to, but to say that you really see the value of it. And, and I think that now you're seeing that with Moonlight winning an Academy Award, with um, us, you know, this, the whole, this whole new genre of black horror that's coming out with Jordan Peele, uh, Black Panther, uh, Crazy Rich Asians. You know, you're looking at different stories that are making the big screen and making a lot of money mm -hmm. doing so. They are, but there's so, still a little bit of the backlash with like Green Book and other movies that come in and that sort of find the white savior. Well, uh, the white savior thing, that's the, that's the old model, right? That's the thing that needs to get it's not phased yet. out. Yeah. But, <laughs> it's slow but and you steady. Look at, you look at like even Ava DuVernay who, to this day, it, it, it's crazy to me that she never, you know, that she never won an Oscar for her, um, for the biopic about Martin Luther King. But here she is now succeeding on multiple platforms in television and nurturing the, the art and the writing careers and the directing careers of other women in her community. And so you're, I think you're really seeing a lot of women directors and women, in, in, women as producers and women in those higher positions of power saying, okay, we get it now. We see, um, and and there there is an influx of wanting those voices. So, you know, when people always they're like, have things changed? It's hard to tell, right? Because we're not seeing these big Harvey Weinstein level stories come out in the New York Times anymore, where individuals who are harmful and problematic are being taken down. Um, instead, what you are seeing is the system sort of slowly crumbling. It's it's going to take a long time, it's going to take a lot of patience and perseverance, but ultimately I think it's, it is the incremental cumulative change that is going to um, make that industry and even industries like the writing industry, which we really need it, we need it in the literary world, um, for, for it to be an equal playing field so that more, more voices of different kinds can be heard. Yeah, well, I am excited for all that change to happen. I love the unsettled feeling of everything that's happening right now. I yeah, think it lean into to, it. It's yeah, all good. It's all, it's all good. It's all good. And I think that your book um, explores all of this in a way that's so passionate, the way that we're seeing you right now, but also in a way that's really personal. Yeah. And I appreciate that you lay yourself out like that. That's a tough thing to do. The book was really powerful. Thank you, Rich. And really meaningful. And it's so nice to have you here, Amber Tamblin. Always happy to be here. The book is Era of Ignition, Coming of Age in a Time of Rage and Revolution. Amber Tamblin, thanks for being here. Thank you.
All right, folks, stick around. I'm Rich File. You're watching our day two coverage of AWP 2019 here in Portland, Oregon.